So I'm Dawn Jolly, I'm based in Connecticut currently. I'm the president and founder of the Connecticut Freedom Alliance, as well as We the Patriots USA, which is a new organization uh, seeking nonprofit status that we just began um, on the 244th birth of our beautiful country. Uh, we are seeking to link all patriots, anyone who loves freedom, any organization, whether it's home birthing, homeschooling, medical freedom, um, Second Amendment rights, First Amendment rights, freedom of religion, doesn't matter. If you love freedom, we want to talk to you and we want to link arms. Um, I'm a Navy veteran and most importantly, a mother of three. And I got into this uh, completely by accident. Uh, I signed up for the delayed entry program when I was 16. I wanted out of the Bronx and my family was too poor to afford to put me through college. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna join the military. I'm gonna see the world. I'm gonna serve my country and I'm going to reap the benefits of getting an education from that. Um, I come from a family full of military, uh, Vietnam War, Korean War, um, my brother served in, during Gulf times, um, my father's retired NYPD, my mother worked as a civilian for the NYPD, I have three cousins that were in NYPD, I come from a family full of law enforcement and military, um, and, and I was very happy to be able to do that, at, especially at such a young age, I left when I was 17 and a half, both my parents had to sign for me, and um, you know, one of the first things you do is you get vaccinated, you know, they have a whole long list that they go through and, and dosing you up. And it's actually funny, last night I pulled out my military service records and started going through them again. Um, you know, I haven't looked over them much over the last, it's been 18 years now. <laughs> and the documentation of me receiving vaccines and passing out, becoming unconscious on the floor where medics had to come and revive me, um, bronchitis, pneumonia, asthma, I mean, the list it's just incredible and at the time at 17 I mean what do I know uh, I stick my arm out sure that's what I need to do let's do it and it wasn't until I became pregnant with my son uh, just a few short years after that I started doing research on this because it was funny I was willing to submit myself to anything that my superiors told me to do the second I found out I was pregnant I was like okay time to research like my baby can't be affected by anything you know and I started reading all about organic foods because, you know, I didn't grow up with a healthy diet and, um, you know, vaccinations were one of the topics that came up. And I actually came upon a book by um, our friend, Dr. Bob Sears, his father had written years ago. And then I helped host a conference where I met Larry, Dr. Larry Pulveski, and I started learning and, and hearing all that he was saying. And I was like, my kids will never have that happen to them. Never, I'm, I'm never gonna take that chance. Um, but naive as I was at the time, not knowing that standard operating procedures far surpass whatever I had in mind. Um, my son was born in Portsmouth Naval Facility um, down in Virginia. And when I was sleeping, they took him from me in the middle of the night and they gave him hepatitis B and vitamin K. They circumcised him without permission. They, they literally went down the list. They put Demerol in my IV because I was too feisty of a patient for them. Um, I kept, it was a training facility. So I kept getting up and locking the door because I didn't want all these random nurses and doctors coming into my room. Um, and that's really what set me on this path because my son had encephalitis and the next nine months of my life would become a living hell. And I actually was honorably discharged under a family hardship because of the issues that my son was having. So um, that really got me on fire in this medical freedom movement. So I've been in it for quite a long time. Um, we founded the Connecticut Freedom Alliance just last year because I moved to Connecticut and um, I saw that there were a lot of issues going on locally. We have a lot of corruption in our state, just like our friends in California and New York and everywhere else understand. Um, and we've gotten even more active during this whole COVID situation. And I really just want to bring it to light, especially we had um, a friend, Erin on Tucker just a few weeks ago. Uh, she's also a military veteran exposing what's been going on during this whole COVID situation in New York and Ground Zero. And people just don't understand, you know, everyone here is you sacrifice for your country, but you don't know that you sacrifice your own body. You know, I've been fighting for 18 years to try to regain my health. Like there's not a day that I wake up that I wake up feeling good. You know, I wake up, I'm exhausted, my body hurts. Like I have a laundry list of autoimmune conditions, but you know what, that doesn't stop because now I'm gonna fight even harder, 10 times as hard. My mental resilience and the passion that I have to make sure that we're able to save other children and other people from experiencing this 
far surpasses anything else. And, you know, we're all parents on here. We know there's nothing more important than our children. And, and right now at this time, uh, such a critical time in history, we have to save our country and we have to save our world. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Yeah, so, so one of the things that most of the citizens of not only this country, but the rest of the world don't understand is through the Department of Defense and through the U.S. Agency for International Development, which sounds very innocuous. USAID sounds like something that we're trying to do good things around the world with. But through those programs, since the 1950s, under a ruling that was done called Ferris v. U.S., it was in 1950. And at that point in time, courts held that a thing called incident to service was a medical condition that no service member could ever claim damages or any form of benefit because any actions taken incident to service were deemed to be part of what it meant to enlist. And one of the things that bothered me, I started working obviously in my first deployment in, in Central America during the war that didn't exist in a conflict that didn't exist. And I started looking at a number of different lies that were being told around this issue. And I started asking some interesting questions, which is why is it that since the records have been kept, there are 3,522 clinical trials that have initiated with the Department of Defense, 3,522 tr clinical trials. Most of them organized through Walter Reed, through Johns Hopkins, Dr. Buttar just mentioned MD Anderson. You'd be surprised at how many alleged great clinical centers around the country, in fact, are fronts for major, major military experimentation very early on. So MD Anderson being one of many. But, but the tragedy is it's not limited to the United States. Most of you don't know that, for example, what we've done under USAID is extended the definition of military service to include any clinical trial of any enlisted person for whom there is no redress under the Federal Tort Claims Act. So if you go forward from 1950, and, and, and history is full of this. I mean, if we go back to the Tuskegee experiments where, where there was a willful infection of African-American service members for the simple purpose of using humans as a agent of experimentation. And the reason why we selected the Tuskegee Airmen was very simply because there is no recourse if you are enlisted. And this is something that is codified under 21 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 50. If you go in and look at Section 50.20, which is the first point of the clinical trials protocols that were set up that were supposedly in response to the Nuremberg war crimes that were conducted during the Second World War, there was this notion that somehow or another we would never allegedly do that again. And what's that? That is the experimentation without consent on human beings. But for reasons that are absolutely nefarious, going back to what's called the military industrial complex, most people only focus on the industrial side. They think of the defense companies. They think of the, the companies that make munitions and armaments. But what they don't understand is the military industrial complex has more prevalence in our chemical and in our pharmaceutical industry than it does in armaments. We have experimented with things like Agent Orange. We've experimented with all sorts of things like asbestos. If you're in the Navy, there's no chance that you weren't exposed to ships that had airborne contaminants. And all of these things are not only harmful to our service members, but violate the core principle of the military, which is that the warfighter must always be prepared. But what we've done is we've curated our service members and men and women who enter into service, many of coming from economic disadvantage or socioeconomic disadvantage, and we have treated them with absolute contempt. We are not making the best warfighter. We are actually putting them on the front line in service to a medical and industrial industry that can recklessly and willfully harm and kill them. And there is no accountability. This got worse in 2017. In 2017, a study was done retrospectively on the preceding 10 years. And during that period of time, there were 
a total of 512 clinical trials that were commenced by the Department of Defense on active military personnel, none of which inform, involved their informed consent. They were compelled to take vaccines, compelled to take therapies, compelled to take interventions, and not a single one of them was given the option to participate or not. 120 of them were deemed unsafe for the normal population. 120. Now you think, I wish I was making this up. We as a country are killing our servicemen and women. We are debilitating our servicemen and women. And in 2017, the precedent for Operation Warp Speed was passed by executive order and by Congress. A partnership between the Department of Defense and the US Food and Drug Administration which reinforced the willful neglect of the well-being of soldiers and willfully neglected the well-being of their future, both as war fighters and as citizens, such that companies can recklessly engage in absolute immunity so that when we get to February 4th of this year, on February 4th of this year, Operation Warp Speed, which is a partnership between the Department of Defense and the Food and Drug Administration, has decided that our service men and women not only cannot have informed consent, but because they are enlisted, they are not given a single right to make sure that their bodies, their health, and their well being are defended. Um, it's mind blowing to think that, you know, I think as veterans, you know, we go in and, and I went in at 17 myself, uh, stood on the yellow footprints at Paris Island, uh, got in a huge argument for about two weeks with my mom about joining the Marine Corps. Um, and, and fortunately, I won, but not after a big battle. And you go in and then, you know, two in the morning, you've got all these shots going in and to everybody's point, you know, I'm like, what is anthrax? And I'm getting this anthrax shot for something that I, you know, to Dr. Batar's point that I haven't even faced yet, but they're preparing me for it, right? They're preparing me for it. And then it's, it's constantly the boosters or the flu shot or whatever. And, you know, of course, I'm sure all of us have experienced some type of reaction, definitely not to the extent that, that you did that I know of in this forum, but imagine how many people are out there that never said anything. They were the, the blind sheep just serving their country and, you know, Uncle Sam would never do that to me. Old oh, glory. They love us. Right. Um, and I'm the biggest patriot out there. So I just want to share this with military people, at least in law enforcement people. And to give you an idea of what you can do, because everything that everybody suggested is powerful stuff. And this is this is my contribution to what I think you can do. Um, as David said, the most important component in any military operation or any military throughout history has been readiness. So we call it battle readiness. And in the US Armed Forces, there's always a competition. And it's I've done, at least it used to be, every March timeframe. So you'd go January, February, and by March 31st, uh, there was a competition to see which of the armed forces was 100% battle ready. And this is based upon you know, armaments and making sure your machines are working and weapons are clean and making sure you know supplies are in check and everything is done uniforms and you know all the aspects but also part of that is battle readiness is defined as the fitness of the soldier medical records being up to date vaccinations all these components that's all part of battle readiness and so each of the military so each of the posts and within each branch has their own scoring system and then each post then supplies the data to whichever headquarters are for whichever armed forces. And then that is determined, combined and determined which armed forces had better, uh, was the most battle ready, okay? And so this, I know until 1996, which is when I got out of the military, this was something that was always uh, a big thing. It was a big competition. And uh, I served with the uh, Fifth Special Forces Group with the 2nd Infantry Division. I was attached to the 101st Air Assault Division. And then of course, the things that I did in garrison as a doctor, but this battle readiness component was taken seriously by every aspect, whether you were quartermaster corps 
or you know whether you were military police, no matter what branch within your, your armed service you were in, everybody took this very seriously. They had to take it seriously. Well, in 1994, um, I, I had the experience, which probably most of you have, and I've asked this in audiences of a few thousand people when I asked this question, how many times have you had the flu, right? I've only had the flu twice in my life, and both times I had had the flu shot, and then I got the flu. And when I asked, you know, what has been the experience of the audience, virtually half the crowd will say the only time I got the flu was when I got the flu shot, all right? Now, this was my experience. I didn't know anything about vaccines at the time. You know, I, I've been a doctor now for three years. I graduated from medical school in 1991. I've done my internship, you know, I've done my um, uh, hardship tour in Korea. I'm, I'm back in, in, on the state side. <clears throat> I'm waiting to start my residency at Brook Army Medical Center. And, and so it, all these weird things are happening. And, you know, you, you're young and you're full of piss and vinegar and, you know, you're gonna change the world. And so here I am, <clears throat> but I've had the flu shot twice. <clears throat> And both times I got the flu. So, you know, common sense, uh, you know, general surgeons are, are pretty simple, right? One and dot, cut it out, heal with steel. So that was my mentality. Okay, it's very simple. I got two shots. I got the flu two times. I'm not going to get the flu shot again. That's it. It's pretty much simple. There was nothing else about, you know, anti-vax. And this is 1994, right? National Vaccine Initiative just rolled out in 1991, only three years before. I didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> and I decided I'm not going to take the flu shot. And that was it. Well, unbeknownst to me, these numbers that are monitored and that are looked at and then are compiled, look at every single soldier at every different aspect that they can look at for battle readiness. And so apparently, unbeknownst to me, on Fort Jackson, South Carolina, which is where I was, there was only one, that's the largest trade out for the US Army, the Training Indoctrination Center. That was the largest one at that time. I think it still is. We process close to 52,000 soldiers every year coming through. So every soldier at Fort Jackson was battle ready except for one. And that was yours truly. Of course, I didn't know about this. And so it's a 10 o'clock in the morning on a, like a Wednesday morning shifts in the ER were always slow, right? I mean, daytime shifts always at nighttime, especially weekends, that's when it gets busy. So I usually ended up working nights or on the weekends, but it just so happened that my week this week was during the weekday. So it's like, you know, you might see one patient every two or three hours, right? It was really slow. I'm in the ER, I'm seeing some lady that came in. She'd had a heart attack a couple of months earlier. She was having some chest pain. So I'm sitting and talking to this lady or standing and talking to this lady. And in walks a sergeant major, the command sergeant major for the post, right? So it's an E9, but he's a head E9 for the post. And he's got six soldiers with him, all E5s and above. And he comes up and he says, sir, uh, I need to talk to you. And I see the command sergeant major, you know, so I said, well, sergeant major, have a seat. I'll be right with you. He says, no, sir, I need to see you right now. I'm like, sergeant major, I'm, I'm with the patient right now. He says, sir, I have direct orders from the post commander, a two-star general. I have direct orders from a post commander right now and I need to talk to you right now. So I'm like, it can't wait till I'm done with this patient sergeant. He said, no, sir, it can't. So I called one of the other docs that was sitting there, you know, reading a comic book and asked him to take over for me. And so I'm like, okay, sergeant major, what was so important that had to be de dealt with right now? And he said, sir, I need to go in a private place. I'm like, what do you mean in a private place? And he said, I need to be in a private room with you, sir. <clears throat> so I walk into one of the trauma rooms and we walk in there and they are all these, you know, five soldiers, uh, with six soldiers with the sergeant major walk in single file behind them and they shut the wow. door. And I'm thinking, this is weird. Like, we're in a trauma room, doors are shut. You usually never shut the trauma doors uh, unless there's multiple traumas or something. So, you know, it's like, what is going on? And uh, <clears throat> the sergeant major says, sir, I'm here to make sure that you get your flu shot and he pulls out a flu shot. Wow. And I'm looking at the Sergeant Major and I look at these guys, these six guys. And they're all kind of, they're, they're, some of them are looking down, some are looking around. Now, two of these guys knew me from the gym. They'd spotted for me or I'd spotted for them. So I knew these guys from the post gym. But the other four I didn't know. And, I, you know, I knew who the Sergeant Major was, but I don't think I'd ever had a conversation with them directly. I mean, you know, 52,000 soldiers going through every year. It's a big post. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell's going on? You're going to force a flu shot? I mean, this is what I'm thinking. So, of course, I was a captain at the time, and these are all enlisted people. And so I've got my, you know, I don't have any headgear on. 
but I have my rank on my on my uniform, on my battle dress uniform. So I start to undo my BDUs. And you know, Sergeant Major's taking the air out from the syringe. And I take my BDUs off and I lay it on the gurney. And I look at Sergeant Major and I say, Sergeant Major, you see right now that I have no rank on. Because once I took them off my uniform, my, my shirt, I still have my, my brown undershirt on, but you know, my battle dress uniform below, boots and everything. But I had taken off my shirt, which has the only insignia with your name and your rank. So once I took that off, there was no, you couldn't tell me from a, you know, I could be a, a three-star general or I could be a private E1. There's no difference, no distinction factor. So I said, Sergeant Major, you see I have no rank on anymore. And he said, yes, sir, I do. And so when I was taking off my BDUs, he thought I was getting ready to take the injection. <laughs> and I said, Sergeant Major, you know, you can do whatever you want, and I'm sure you're going to get that needle in me. But I have no rank on, so you will not be held court-martial for hitting an officer. But there's no effing way that needle's going in me. And those two guys that knew me, I mean, you know, I was in my prime then, and, and they, I mean, there was no way that I was going to take six soldiers plus another sergeant major plus seven. So there was no way they would have gotten the shot at me. And, you know, I would have probably been hurt. I would have broken some ribs myself. I would have been maybe out of a fracture job, but there was going to be a couple of those guys that were going to also be hurt. And the sergeant major looks at these soldiers and these soldiers are kind of looking at the sergeant major like, what did you just drag us into? You know, these two guys that I know, they're like looking at each other like, I, I don't want to be here. This is not right. You know, you could tell it was the level of energy in that place went to a place that I have rarely, rarely experienced. But I knew in my core, and I didn't know anything about the science of vaccines or anything. I knew in my core, there is no way that I'm going to take this damn flu shot because I was, I felt sick when I got the flu those two times and I wasn't going to have it again. But I also knew there's something wrong when, when seven people that have taken the same type of oath as I have to defend and protect the U.S. Constitution are in here with a direct order to make sure the Butar's battle ready. And so you know, I, re I remember thinking that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sizing him up. I'm trying to say, you know, I was a martial artist. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at these guys. I'm thinking, you know, who can I hit in the knee and take out right away? Like, which, which are the two weakest that I can take out of the game right away so that now I'm only struggling with four or five of them. And I'm just sizing them up. I was a bouncer all through college. So, you know, have, being in, in a situation um, with multiple people was not uncommon. I, I'd had enough experience, but usually those people were drunk. You know, I didn't have like seven trained soldiers that I was dealing with. So there was a little bit of uh, apprehension, but I knew there was no way that shot was going in me. And Sergeant Major looks at his soldiers and he's got the air out. He walks right up to me and I'm, you know, he, nobody else moved. He walks right up to me and goes right past me. There was a sink in the trauma room. And so I'm, I was, I didn't know what he was gonna do, but I mean, I was ready, you know, and he walks by me and he stands by the sink and he looks at his soldier and he says, I'm now about to administer this vaccine to Dr. Buttar. Does anybody have an issue with this? And they're all looking at each other and they're like, uh, they're confused. He, no, everybody says, you know, no, answers no, Sergeant Major, we're good. Sergeant Major squirts the vaccine into the sink and turns onto his soldiers. He goes, I have now administered the vaccine to Captain Buttar. Does anybody have an issue with this? And the soldiers are like, who was Sergeant Major? I mean, everybody was like, really, oh, man, this is going to be no issue here. You know, and I'm saying I actually was shocked that he did that. And he turns around. He says, sir, you know, salutes me. Thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to give you the vaccine. And I'm like, who was Sergeant Major? I saluted him back. They single file walked out. Fort Jackson was battle ready. The last soldier had been given the vaccine <laughs> and the story ended there. Now, why am I telling you that story? I'm telling that story because it doesn't matter what you do as long as you do something and you have to be willing to go all out. If you, I tell my kids this all the time, go hard or go home. And if you're going to engage, you better damn well make sure you are 100% ready to engage all the way. And this is a situation that we're in right now as not just soldiers or law enforcement or the people that are on this call, but this is where we are from a humanity level right now. Every person on this planet dealing with this idiocy from wearing a face mask and social distancing, all these aspects, we are right now, if we are not resisting, if you are going to consent to or, or comply with these absurd orders, that is consenting to them. If you comply, you are consenting. And this is the thing that people have to understand. 
That is a huge step. Can I just jump in for a quick second with history? Um, you brought up uh, 29 years ago when you brought up 1950s, um, but a lot of people may not be aware that this goes back over 100 years. Oh, yeah. We're talking the Spanish flu um, that didn't originate in Spain, of course. It originated down in Kansas, and it wasn't a flu. It was a bacterial infection. Why? Soldiers had been vaccinated with a bacterial meningococcal vaccine. And then all of a sudden, we have, what, millions of deaths around the world. I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize this has been going on such a yes. long time, and we've been lied to since day one. I mean, how many people still believe the Spanish flu was the Spanish flu? Probably most of society. Um, so, so it's really important for us to take steps back to, to understand how long this has been happening. You can go online and read the papers from the NIH, Dr. Frederick Gates, was the doctor that was implicit in that. And, and you can, it, it's just mind blowing when you realize that this has been happening to our frontline soldiers since day one. And China is now testing their experimental coronavirus vaccines on who? Their military first. Yeah. So this is a global issue, just like everything else.